So I guess I'm the last presenter. Um, thank you. Um, two things you need to know before we get going, which I put a lot of context. One will become obvious in a second. My first Rico. You know, ever so. You know, closing a Rico for your first Rico right, seems like a kind of a bad idea. Um, and secondly, I think it's probably even more important. Uh, unlike most of you in the room, I only became obsessed with specialty coffee about six or seven years ago, so about 2012, 2013. Um, so, the, so the double bad dude in first Rico comes with very limited experience exposure, right? And I'm supposed to spend 18 minutes kind of talking to you about the, you know, why you should listen to an, a, a new tool that we're trying to develop for specialty coffee. Um, so to set context is the only way that you can get value from the next 18 minutes um, is I'm a fairly normal business school professor in my day job, right? So I've been doing this for about 20 years, doing research, teaching, and um, meta conclusion that I'm gonna try to go over, there's just something about the global specialty coffee market that just seems odd to somebody who's been trying to understand markets. Right? Odd is probably an understatement, but there's just, there's just a weirdness in there that just can't be allowed to persist. Um, and I want to basically share a few interactions and anecdotes along the way that sort of produced this conclusion, right, that the market is just a little bit too odd you know, for its own good. I'm, I'm putting this up behind me. Um, most of you will recognize what it is. Um, it may not be the elephant in every room, but if you listen closely to my first four stories that I want to tell, the thing that I think becomes sensible you know, in those stories is that this elephant is always in the room. So story number one, way back in the day, taking students, meeting small groups of cooperatives, and I've just been kind of doing a lot of research on my own, just trying to look at where retail prices were for specialty coffee. And again, very new you know, to all this. And we've got a conversation going, and I just asked these folks, because I thought it was just a, an obvious and naive question, what's your aspiration you know, when it comes to price per pound you know, for your coffee? And holy smokes, everyone looks at their shoes. Like, we're just, we just don't talk about this kind of stuff. A little bit more prodding was almost like we don't really have the opportunity to form expectations about prices. And finally, because man, persistent, I got students who are looking at me, you know, I got one guy to say about $3 a pound, right? If I knew that I could get $3 a pound regularly, this is a business that I would love to be in and love to hand off to my kids. $3 a pound. So I started talking a little bit about what retail prices looked like in North America, sort of that notion that it's not uncommon to see $20 a roasted pound for specialty coffee. Uh, two of them piped up right away and said, I think $3 is a little low then, right, if other folks are getting 20 So there's that kind of weird notion of kind of going, y'all don't seem to have a really good pricing context. Right? And fast forward about a year later, different guy. I just learned that this guy is a small grower in Nicaragua again. Um, his coffee routinely, 89, 91, 90, right across the board, an awesome producer. So I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be a happy story, right? So, so, you know, bring the students around, gather, start talking. I say, hey, what's the best price you ever got you know, for your coffee? And, of course, this was coming off the roller coaster. He goes, it was last year. Last year I got almost $3 a pound you know, for my coffee. And I says, oh, this is awesome. And uh, just out of context, you know, worst price? Uh, he goes, oh, that will be this year. I was like, huh? Like, again, expecting a happy story, right, huh? And he goes, yeah, this, this year I won't cover my cost of production this year. I was like, oh, okay, again, students watching, business school professor going, <laughs> make sense of this. Surely, like, what happened, a like, different buyer, same buyer. And I went, whoa, that's weird. That's weird. Like, so the green prices in this thing, and again, nothing you don't know. So it seems to be, like, way, way oversensitive to something that seems very not sensible, to people in this market to go from like almost three to not covering cost of production with the same buyer when your coffee's still 90. Right? And so so I'm, I'm now kind of getting energized. I don't pretend to know as much when I go to Origin now with my students, uh, but I got a chance to sit on a panel in Guatemala. It was a flea conference and it was, it was dedicated to, to coffee, this particular panel. And the other folks in the panel don't remember names, but the first thing was, especially coffee has a big problem. And they use the example of like Starbucks forecast it's going to need 100 million pounds more coffee itself per year to meet its own growth demands. Like, oh. And the second one, I say, yeah, but the problem is, is that all the young people, right, in coffee, they're walking away from farms. They don't want to take over their parents' farms. Right? And so, you know, it comes to me, and I'm just literally going, and I haven't said a lot out loud yet, but I'm kind of going, you know, there's a variable that's supposed to move. Right? If somebody wants more of something, but supply is kind of going the other way, so there's this mechanism called price. And I can't imagine that if you had more reasonable and exciting prices that some of the kids wouldn't stay and grow more coffee for the Starbucks at all. Right? And so there's that weird thing going, like, what makes all those stories 
you know, kind of sensible, right, and this kind of stuff. It's this kind of weird over-obsession with this one big elephant in the room. So you fast forward, I'm getting a little bit more confident now. I'm actually in the Specialty Coffee Association meetings, and it was last year when people were beginning to more vocally rail right, against pricing, or, you know, talking about pricing and commodity, right, and, every, and a little bit of sea bashing kind of going on for sure. But one very courageous young man kind of went up and he said something along the lines of, I know this is going to be contrarian, but I need the sea price. I need the sea price because I have to know that the prices I'm paying are appropriate. If I don't have context, I don't know whether I'm over and under pricing, right? And there's, you know, pause in the room, and, you know, I, I set myself as, like, not being as concerned as others about what people think about me. Right, so they sort of looked over at me at the table, and I said, well, I guess I'll take it. Right, and I said, the first thing is, is you're, you're kind of right. right. Markets need context. They need benchmarks. And anything where we go in and we have a conversation about price, there's no such thing as we naively knowing what something should be worth. Like, we need to kind of look around and suddenly you know, talk about like, benchmarks to know where to start, where to start a, stop a conversation. So I said, you're absolutely right. You need a benchmark. You just, you just don't need that one. Right? And this kind of stuff. And I said, I'm going to say this for the first time out loud. I said, I think a good metaphor for all of us is kind of like Tarzan and the vines, you know, going through the jungle. Right? So Tarzan basically will never let go of one vine until Tarzan has the next one to grab onto. Now, there's a bit of an act of faith in there in between because, you know, you're not holding on to both vines at the same time. It's not how it works. Right? But if you don't see the next vine, right, then what happens is Tarzan will just sort of swing backwards and then swing backwards. And we've been swinging back and forth on the same vine. I was like, yeah, I made that up. And then I'm going, hey, that kind of makes sense to me. It's the Tarzan metaphor, right, and this kind of stuff. So somebody said, and very reasonable question, so what's the next vine look like? And I think I made some comment, which is a little glib. I said anything, like almost anything would be better than that. And then I went one step further, and this reveals a little bit about myself. I said, my weight, right, is a better benchmark. You know, for specialty coffee than the C. And they go, your weight, I said, has never gone below 225, right, as an adult man. So it's never gone below 225. It has actually on rare occasion gone above 300, right, and this kind of stuff, right? And it has that appropriate day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week wiggle in it that keeps all the hedge fund people happy too, right? You could do a whole lot of forecasting models, right? And so I kind of went like this. So, so my weight would be better. And then when I pushed a little bit, I go, well, actually, that graph there, if you sort of flipped it, that's actually been my weight since 2016, right? It's sort of this whole thing, but it's, but it's been going up. And if we were sitting here like, you know, a good 45 pounds more than we were in 2016, we wouldn't be having the same conversation, right? But then somebody comes up, and again, you know, you get off the glibness, right? And then you sort of go, well, the, the one thing you have to go, oh, Peter, your weight has nothing to do with specialty coffee, right? And I'm kind of going, well, there's where we bring the two stories together. Neither does the sea. Right. Now, I know that the C is, is implicated in all conversations, but it just doesn't seem to have any correspondence. When you think about that idea, I'm going through, we're talking about your coffee, I'm cupping it, I'm making sure I get mine, that's the world of specialty. Right? And there's a couple of bars indicating what specialty's been doing on the demand side. Right? And actually go back and you sort of say, hey, that graph of your weight right, would once again be a little bit better surrogate you know, than the C price. All right, so then so you kind of go back and go, well, that's kind of where the conversation starts. And that's roughly around the time I met Chad. And he said, don't ever tell the weight story again. And so I promised him I wouldn't. Um, but he said, you know, we're going to need a slightly better idea. And I said, so the better idea that we sort of come up with, again, simple comparison, nothing big or new. Um, when people buy cars or when people buy houses, right, they have these two things that they can go to. They have this thing called the Kelly Blue Book, right, and they have this thing or services like Zillow. Right? And all those things do is when you're about to embark and deciding I want a 2017 BMW, right, you can go onto the Kelly Blue Book and it can kind of say recently, this is what these things sold for, low end, medium end, high end. Doesn't tell you what you're going to get, doesn't mean there's not a deal to be had, but that's the reasonable range. Real estate, the same thing. You know, you kind of walk out there and you will kind of go, I'm, I'm interested in this house. The realtor will always go, what's the comparables? Like, what have similar houses sold for in your neighborhood? And you go, that is really sensible in a context which could do the following. So you want to buy a used car. Forget all the particulars. The global supply and demand conditions for cars right, are such. And you go, what are you talking about? That has nothing to do with the 2017 BMW. Or I'm looking to buy a house in an affluent neighborhood, and someone goes, the global supply and demand conditions for housing 
right, R, and you would go, again, it makes no sense, and it goes, it makes no sense. You know, so what we need is we need something like the blue book, right? And then the problem is with the blue book, you say, well, God, it's really simple, right? But what does it need? It needs the people who had last year's prices to kind of give them up and make them available. And that's why I'm really excited about what we're here on today. I'm gonna to tell you in a second all the things that this project is not, right? I just think it's an important movement in the direction of the kind of sense and sensibility, right? We get better sense making when it comes to use cars, right, than we do for coffee. But what did you need? You needed people to give up their data. And this is where a cynical business school professor guy goes, no one's gonna do that. Like, I get very like, why does no one know anything about private equity? It's because private equity guys don't give up their data. And this is where Chad, thank you, goes, there are people in this sector that think similarly enough that we can do this, right? And with, I would say, very little effort on my part, thank you, Chad, right? We actually managed to gather together 21 folks, right, who basically uh, you know, allowed us to start moving in the direction of a blue book. Now, all the pluses and minuses as you walk down says, that certainly doesn't represent the entire market. It does not yet but it could, right? But if you go down, don't dismiss it because it's a non-trivial part of the market that has been demonstrating a certain sensibility you know, in it, and wouldn't that be better guidance you know, moving forward is like rely on that sliver, non-representative sliver of the market because it seems more sensible than always going back to that one C bind that we keep swinging back and forth on. And the final thing that's very important down here, look at the three bucks. Right? The dude in northern Nicaragua in 2012 was remarkably prescient right, about what prices look like. The center of gravity in this sample, right, in terms of medians, is like three bucks. Now you pause right there and you should go and you're gonna go, surely there has to be more, Peter, because this is kind of what we're talking about. You mentioned like the 2017 BMW versus the 1998 Kia. Right? So I'm going to basically kind of go, that one price doesn't help us, yes. But if you go back and say things like, one we recognize in specialty that we have different scenarios. Sometimes we buy a lot of ordinary. Sometimes we buy small amounts of exquisite. And you just know for a fact that both of those different contexts, they need different benchmarks. Right? And so if you do feel motivated to look at kind of where we are and where we're going, this is the most exciting accessible graphic. Right? And it does nothing else is it sort of says, that seems kind of sensible. So as you basically go from one side to the other, you're basically talking about large to small. As you go in each of these slopes, you're going lower quality to high quality. I've heard it over and over again. Peter, people have to price quality. Yes, they do. Surely you're not saying buying like 800 pounds of a micro lot is the same as, no, I'm not. Right? And so you look at this and you should get excited. Right? You should get excited for a couple of different reasons, not because it's complicated. In fact, if you walked away through all this thing, you know, I'm a business school professor, I have a PhD, right? all I do in this project is I calculate medians. Right? And I've been doing that for 20 years, right? I can calculate medians. This is not hard. Right? It's not complicated, sorry, it is hard. It is hard because people got to go by and they have that risk moment of going, do I want to participate? What does that mean? Right? But as kind of more people kind of get over that part, it's just as easy to calculate a median from a larger sample right, than it is from a smaller sample. So I'm kind of I'm excited about this. Second critique we get, oh, this is not the silver bullet. This is not the one thing. And again, listen, dude, this problem has been around references to colonialism, references to slavery. Right? Forget the content, a good long time. Right? What one thing do we need to do to fix this? There is not one thing. But the way that I like to think about this, if I was going to rebuild a house, right, I'd probably want to have a good hammer. Right? And someone's going to come up and say, you can't build a house with just a hammer. And go, no, 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 you need a lot of other stuff too. Right? But you, you need a hammer right? and this kind of stuff. So that idea, like, don't walk away from this because, oh, smug man on stage thinks he's solved specialty. Right? And it's kind of because that's not what we think at all. Right? Go down one further, all you're doing is lauding those people. Like every moment in specialty coffee is for people to pat themselves in the back and say, I'm a better person than you because I pay more. And we get this, all this commentary back and forth and going, to be honest, we are relying on people feeling like this is the right thing to do. And that's the motivation for our data donors. But it's, it's anonymous donation. Right? There's no chest thumping. Right? And what the market wants to do, it doesn't want to give everybody an obscenely high price. It wants to help people find out you're growing there at that quantity, at that quality. What are a reasonable set of expectations? 
So get off this idea that we're sort of sitting here where we have a bunch of our cool friends that pay a lot of money and we're going over there trying to certify as being 100% transparent. That's not what this is about. This is about using that input so the market can become more sensible. All right, and then the final thing I look at is going, but Peter, it doesn't tell you what the price should be. I go, that's the whole thing about the house and the car and about everything special, right? There is no one price, right? There are prices. And everybody who looks at these medians and gets excited, the university researcher loves the fifth percentile to 95th percentile spread more than the medians because it tells folks in specialty there's more than you, a roadside, and a quality score, right, that determines the future success of you as a business person, right? In specialty, story matters. Relationship building matters. Access, you know, matters. And, man, if you could start, like, building some sort of reorienting, like global value streams, love that. You know, if we could start kind of thinking about this as a foundation so you could more reliably plan into your future, I think we'd be talking about something that would be a lot more awesome than the vine that we're currently swinging on. Um, so, you know, at the end, um, we think we got a really good start here on the basis of goodwill from 21 folks, a slight correction moving forward that 21 has become 25 and will probably hit north of 30, right, in terms of people that kind of go, I actually want to win in the game of specialty coffee. And I, this is me projecting, and so I apologize. Like, I actually want to walk away from a negotiation where I got a really good price, but I don't feel like a jerk, right? That whole kind of idea at the end of the day sort of says, I'm in that kind of negotiations where we're sort of equally informed and equally, and then we'll just, we'll hammer it out. That's the kind of world that I think we want to live in. And to be honest, right, I think there's an awful lot of younger people that says, man, you paint a vision of coffee that had that in it, I'd be more excited about being in coffee. So the kind of things that we'd like to thank, um, you know, for those that think it's a little bit too special right now, it is too special. 21's not enough. Uh, to be honest, there's a very large political part of me that says, I think I like the prices as they are. Let's just kind of stick with those. But I'm very sympathetic to the notion that, you know, we have to get a, you know, a better picture, right? So if you're in here and know somebody that might be cajoled into, quote, unquote, doing the right thing, the only lauding you will get is joining those folks and an invitation to come to the Transparency Colloquium right at Emory University in June. Uh, and drinks later on today, but only if you're a data donor. <laughs> um, a couple of things that we have to do, and this again, thanks to Chad. You, know, you can put those tables up and everyone who reads them will know who got screwed, right? But it is actually much better to make sure that the folks on both sides of the transactions are fully aware of the emerging information. And I learned recently for two reasons. One is that if we don't go out of our way to inform the sell side like we're informing the buy side, I get shut down for, by antitrust you know, people because this could be a wonderful vehicle for collusion if the 21 folks just went like this and says, what are we paying you know, this year? So my university attorneys are going, you better. Right? So we're kind of excited about that part. Um, published data briefs, um, what's going on in specialty coffee? The ancillary thing that the university guy just loves, there's a lot of questions that get bantied around that are never answered by data, but they're illuminated you know, by them. And so we can actually start producing and disseminating insights on the basis of what does and does not get priced. Why are prices seem to be different in different regions? Great questions that an expanding database can answer. And the final thing that I think is the most important from a human perspective, I teach in a business school. I always say the thing about a business school is nobody comes to business school to learn how to make minimum wage. Right? Nobody comes to learn to business school to learn how to be a subsistence producer. They're like, I got some stuff going on here. Right? Teach me how to basically I can turn my $60,000 into a new career stream right, and get me my 150. Right? That's kind of what we become good at. And what do we focus on? We focus on things like what's your identity, what's your story, relationship management, effective negotiation. What if you basically got to a point where we could kind of talk to these amazing specialty coffee producers and say, you are more than the quality of your beans. Right, you are a story, a set of relationships, et cetera, and we can start having kind of MBA-esque kind of education as part of capacity building you know, at Origin. And the reason I'm most excited about the prospects is because we did one of those recently as a pilot. The women were massively generous right, to an awkward professor and group of students, some amazing mentors, but we all agreed, right, this is the kind of thing that we need so you can build sort of those correlate assets so as someone gets excited about what price point they want to hit, Right? We actually have some broader guidance to set to say the, the entrepreneurs among you will be leading the next wave of specialty coffee from origin. So um, I'm a minute 18 over, which, by the way, is good for me. Right? So I won't apologize you know, for it. But yeah, thanks very much. Appreciate it.